So if you keep your Bibles open to Luke 24, verses 44 to 49, um, be following that quite, quite closely in this sermon. Brothers and sisters, in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in a line from his ninth century poem, the Christian poet John Scotus writes, Let us therefore hold the supreme victories of Christ as brilliant stars in our minds. Behold, the four corners of the world are clasped by a wooden cross. Over the course of 2,000 years, we have seen the Christian church go through trial and triumph through many fierce struggles. We still go through trial and triumph as a church, both personally and as a church. Victory has always been found at the place of suffering, at the cross, because without the cross of Christ, there is no resurrection. Without repentance, there is no salvation. Without the resurrection, there is no ascension. Without forgiveness, we are lost in our sins. In the scriptures, we have witnessed to the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. And that is the very basis, the very foundation, for the evangelistic zeal of the church to witness to the name of Jesus Christ to the very ends of the earth. Jesus died and rose again. The ends of the earth must hear. All men must be called to repentance and belief. They must see Jesus, and they must know him. The background, or the backdrop to this text, will be Isaiah 49, verse 6. Isaiah has many promises about uh, the coming of, of a Christ who would save the Gentiles. In Isaiah 49, we read, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. We can read such a verse, understanding that it points forward, that it recognizes the saving work of Jesus Christ. In the Gospel of Luke, we see that Christ is the light for the nations. He is the servant. In the church, we are the tribes of Jacob. We are called to bring this light, the light of Jesus Christ, to the ends of the earth. We see this theme accentuated in the book of Acts. The book of Acts is also written by the, gospel, the, the same gospel writer, Luke. Acts is, in a way, Luke part 2. In verses 1 to 11, particularly in verses 7 to 8, we read, He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now first, we must recognize that there are hypocrites in the church, those who profess to witness to Christ, but have never seen his power in their lives. But, if you have repented and received forgiveness of sins, then you are a witness to what Christ is doing in this world. Brothers and sisters, you are witnesses to the glories of Christ. If you are a member of the church, if you have been saved by Jesus Christ, you have seen something of what he is doing in this world. If you are in a faithful church, then you have seen the power of Jesus at work in this world. If you are in Christ, then you are a new creation. That is the confession of Galatians. And it is your joy to point those who don't yet believe to Jesus Christ who takes away the sins of the world. People in the church are identified as witnesses. You have seen Jesus, and it must and will shine brightly into a dark world. All men must see that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. 
So we hear the word of the Lord summarized under this theme today. Our crucified, resurrected, and ascended Jesus Christ sends out his followers as his witnesses. And we will take a look at this under three points. First of all, what is penned or what is written? That covers verses 44 to 46. Second, what is proclaimed? What is the gospel announcement? That is in verse 47. And third, what is promised? What has God promised us? And that is found in verse 49. So first of all, what is penned or what is written? At the beginning of this passage, we see Jesus explaining the scriptures to two men on the road to Emmaus. Beginning with Moses and the prophets, he interprets all things concerning himself. Jesus taught his people with the authority of the Old Testament. The Old Testament was all about him. At the end of this time with Jesus, the two men on the road to Emmaus turn to each other and they confess with one voice, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? When Christ opens our minds, our hearts burn within us. Our hearts burn within us when we read the words of the Old and the New Testaments. In the later verses of this passage, in our text of verses 44 to 49, we read that Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Once again, Jesus points back to how the Old Testament is fulfilled in him when he says, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms might be fulfilled, must be fulfilled. Brothers and sisters, the cross of Jesus Christ stands at the very center of history because this is where our salvation was accomplished once for all. This is what all the saints of the Old Testament longed for with such a desperate longing. This is what we look back to as we serve our risen and ascended Lord. The scriptures are the very basis or the bedrock of our witness. We must know the scriptures. As the apostles seek to witness to the name of Jesus throughout the books of the New Testament, they defend their, their case or their argument from the Old Testament. The little Bibles that have only the New Testament and the book of wis books of wisdom are, in a way, is incomplete because the New Testament is packed full of words from the Old Testament. It is riddled with words from the Old Testament. Because what the apostles are doing in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is showing that Jesus is at the very center of the Old Testament. As we approach our evangelical and missional efforts, the call of the church is to show that Christ stands at the very center of history. He stands at the center of the Old and the New Testaments. That Christ's lordship and his act of saving extends over everything. Every knee must bow, and every mouth must confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And Jesus is exclusively Lord. He is the only way. The Muslims don't have their own God. They have no God. I've heard it said, oh, why, why would we bring the gospel to the Muslims? They have their own God. They're okay. But the Muslims need Jesus Christ. He is the hope of the world. Hindus aren't okay just being good people. There are a lot of Hindus who do a lot of good things. But that's not enough. That won't get them into heaven. Hindus need Jesus. Our unchurched neighbors aren't okay living without God. Our unchurched neighbors need Jesus as well. And this is the message of the scriptures. And Jesus speaks here in this passage with urgency. This is the call. It's a simple call. This is the call upon the church. Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. We see allusions to this or references to this throughout the Old Testament. The ancient authors wrote, they penned a holy gospel 
a good news of a Savior who would come. After God curses fallen man with death in Genesis 3, he also gives a promise. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This is the very central battle of history. This is the crux of history. The world faces endless cycles of sin and death. It's, it just goes on and on and on. The promise in Isaiah was that a man would come, a man would suffer, and in his suffering, he would conquer death itself, because this would be one who is both God and man. We still face this battle in the world, but we look, as we look back to the bloody cross, to the open tomb, we face our battle with the world, the flesh, and the devil with hope and trust that our Savior really is crucified, but also risen and ascended. We know that Jesus is reigning in heaven, and he is with us to the very end of the age. Brothers and sisters, in our friendships with our neighbors, we are witnesses to Jesus Christ. There's no going around that. You have read it here in the scriptures, and so it is imperative, it is necessary, that in word and deed, we always seek to witness to the hope of the gospel. That we witness exclusively to Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ really is the only way for all men. We begin with a commitment to the scriptures, to the word of God, which Jesus opens to his disciples and to, to the two men on the road to Emmaus in this passage. The scriptures, the word of God, is our foundation for understanding the person and work of Jesus Christ and what he has come to do in the world. But at the very center of the gospel is the truth that Jesus died and rose again. What is the simple gospel? I've heard one person describe it in five words, the words that I just mentioned. Jesus died and rose again. People may tip their heads back and laugh, but remember that Paul calls it foolishness to those who are perishing, to those who are being saved. It is the power of God to eternal life. We can pray for our unbelieving friends and neighbors that Jesus would open their minds to understand or to know the scriptures. If Jesus didn't open up our minds, then we would all be lost. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So what is the substance of this message? What is to be proclaimed within this message? In the next line we read, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins, or remission of sins, should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. It's a simple message, and yet it is as deep as it is simple. As we see in the previous verses, that Jesus goes about opening their minds to understand the scriptures. The simple message of the New Testament is repentance and forgiveness of sins. It holds a simple parallel to the words before. In Christ, you have died to sin and risen to new life. The basic pattern or outworking of the Christian life is death and resurrection. It's trial and triumph. It's repentance and forgiveness of sins. But you can always dig deeper into its message. You can always go further. You can always understand and learn more. Repentance simply means a change of mind. It is a deep change within the heart of man, worked through the power of the Holy Spirit. Repentance means that the people of Israel must say sorry or apologize to God for their sins. Repentance means that every nation of the earth must turn to the Lord in fear and repentance. They must abandon their old ways. They must throw off the old man. They must die to their old life. The word for forgiveness can mean anything from a sending away remission, a letting go, a release, pardon, complete forgiveness. Sin 
as we might remember from last week, is missing the mark. It is guilt. Every man and woman experiences guilt of some kind, even if they vehemently deny it. We have sinned, and we have fallen short of the glory of God. But the announcement of the good news of the gospel is that there is forgiveness from sins, there is pardon from guilt, there is release from slavery to our guilt. Basically, Jesus has touched down on foreign soil. We were enemies with God. We were at war with God, his Father. But rather than destroying us as we deserve, he preaches, Christ preaches repentance and forgiveness of sins. And he sends his church into the world to proclaim that same message of repentance and forgiveness of sins. All men must die and rise to new life in Jesus Christ. Men must repent and believe the gospel. We fight a battle, but we fight a battle that gives men life. The Christian religion is no pacifist religion, but at the center of our fight is the proclamation of the good news, the declaration of peace that is found in Jesus Christ. The church, we, are a herald of the good news to the ends of the earth. The word for proclaim is connected to the word for angel. The angels of the seven churches are those who are called to proclaim this good news of repentance and forgiveness of sins. Think about it this way. We as Christians are identified in the book of Hebrews as citizens of heaven. The church is a foreign army that has touched down on foreign soil with the news that Christ has come to release the captives, those who are in captivity or enslaved to their sins. We don't fight with swords that are flesh and blood. Since we do not wrestle against powers of flesh and blood, but we have God's word, the sword of the Spirit, and that is a mighty sword. Our minds have been opened to the scriptures, and we simply cannot keep our mouths shut. We come in armor, but we aren't talking about AK-47s and fighter jets. We are talking about the belt of truth, the breastplate. A breastplate is kind of like a bulletproof vest. The breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit. We want all men to know that there is repentance and forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ. The key to peace in the Middle East is not ultimately dropping more bombs. It's bringing people to see Christ and that peace is found at the cross. And this is what we want. We want our governments and the mosques and the Hindu temples and the secular neighbors and the, and the strip clubs and the bars, and the industries to know that Christ's death and resurrection really stand at the center of history, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins are found only in Jesus Christ. We want all men to know that we serve a risen and ascended Lord, and they must as well. This is, I guess, similar to the underground movement, except it's, it's kind of different too because it's standing right out in the open. We are announcing the good news of Jesus Christ. Every Sunday, we openly declare in our worship services, in our churches, in our words and songs and confessions, that Christ has come to be a light to the ends of the earth. The ends of the earth must hear and turn to the Lord in fear. Before this time, the nations came to the nation of Israel, but now the promises to the Gentiles are fulfilled. As a church, we don't wait for people to come to church. We actively pursue those around us. The pulpit in our church building is a public pulpit. It is not a private pulpit. Because the good news that is declared from it, the good news that comes from God's word, is a public good news. 
Our society may want our Christianity to be privatized. They may want us to just keep the words of the gospel to ourselves. They may want our pulpit to be privatized. We may begin to assume that Christianity is a private religion, but it is not. The pulpit is where the good news is proclaimed in an official capacity. All men everywhere must repent and believe. The churches in Pinocchio and Lacombe are outposts for Jesus. When repentance and forgiveness of sins is proclaimed for the, from the pulpit, that means that repentance and forgiveness of sins is a call to all men to repent and believe in Jesus Christ. It is for every man who is brought to turn from his sins and come to the Lord. Which brings us to our third question. What is promised? Here we see that this work is uh, distinctly Trinitarian. In Matthew 28, we read that we are to baptize all the nations in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In Acts 1, we see that we witness to Jesus and that the Father holds the times and the seasons, and the Spirit will come upon us and give us power. Here we read that the Father will clothe us with the power of the Holy Spirit as we witness to the name of Jesus. Notice that the New Testament distinguishes gifts of the Spirit. Not everyone is a preacher, and not everyone is an evangelist, but everyone does receive the Spirit and the power of the Spirit. If you take a look at the beginning of Acts 2, the Spirit is poured out on the church. Yes, we exercise our gifts, and we grow in our individual and various gifts, but all these gifts are a work of the, of the power of the Spirit. Now, you can't really understand what it means by power until you look closely at the book of Acts and consider the courage of the preachers and the churches that face persecution. Consider the boldness, of, the boldness and courage of Peter and Paul and the martyr Stephen and the layman Jason as they declare the good news of Jesus Christ and call a stiff-necked Jewish people to repentance. This is the work of the Spirit. This does not mean that they were not afraid. They were still men. In Acts 4 verse 29, we read a prayer for courage. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant your servants to continue to speak your word with boldness, after which the Spirit gives them greater courage. As these men go out from Jerusalem and keep on going to the ends of the earth, our Father clothes the church with a spirit of boldness. He gives courage to the preachers. He gives courage to the laymen, the cloth sellers, and the upstanding men like Jason to stand behind the preaching, the true preaching of the gospel. He gives the church courage to witness to King Jesus, to speak when others shut their mouths, to repent when they fall into sin, to live faithful lives when others are encouraging rebellion and revolution, to lose government funding for their schools when the government pushes anti-Christian agendas. To speak against sin when people are telling us to tone it down. To boldly present the gospel truth when all the voices around us are growing shrill. And we have been brought from Acts to the present. This is still a command to us now. Christ must have known how easily men become afraid. You can ask any godly Christian man or woman, and they will confess that they have been afraid many times. Consider when your church faces slander and when your church faces trouble. It is the power of the Spirit who, hold, who holds you true to the power of the gospel. Without the power of the Spirit, we would all compromise. Christians are under an authority that is not our own. We stand underneath the scriptures. We stand underneath God's word. We may have not picked a battle when we should have. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So Christ promised that the Father would clothe us with the power of the Spirit. Often you find the apostles praying for this. 
Often, we in the church must pray, must call out to God for his power. His power to be loving, joyful, peaceful, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. These are the fruits of the Spirit that we must continually pray for. Often, we must pray for the courage to speak out. This is the way that our message of repentance and forgiveness of sin will turn the world upside down for Jesus. As we witness to King Jesus, we need the power of the Spirit. We are insufficient in ourselves because we are weak. We need clothing from on high, just as we need righteousness from God. We need power from on high. Because of the Spirit, we don't give in when we are afraid to witness to King Jesus, to speak out for King Jesus, and to live for King Jesus. If he has saved us, then we will want to tell people about it. That doesn't mean that we run around and clobber people over the head or get into fistfights. It does mean that we speak with boldness and urgency when the opportunity presents itself. There is abundant grace, oceans of grace, in Jesus Christ. He conquered sin and death by dying and rising. And since he ascended, he is Lord, and the Spirit gives us power. People of God, you are the church. This means that you are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. If that salt loses its flavor, it will be tossed into the manure pit. In Luke 24, we see three things. We see what is written in the scriptures, we see what is to be proclaimed in the nations, and we see the promise that we will be clothed with power from the Spirit. We don't earn our salvation by being more evangelistic or by witnessing for Christ, but it is simply a part of the Christian life. And we all have different gifts as well. Some of us are easier able to do it through our actions, through hospitality, through acts of kindness. Others have an easier time with words, telling people about Jesus. To whom much is given, much is required, and we should continue to build on our various gifts, gifts of word and deed. Our witness to the name of Jesus is part of our identity as a people who have been called out of darkness into light. We are the light of the world in Jesus Christ. We are a people who have repented and received forgiveness. We have tasted of a much better world, a much better country. We don't yet have every tear washed away, but we have tasted of this release of guilt in Jesus Christ, this forgiveness of sins, this pardon. We are on a mission to show the world that Jesus really does forgive sins. He can forgive your sins because he has forgiven my sins. That you can be a new creation in Jesus Christ. We are here to show the world that the cross and the resurrection really do change everything. In Acts 26, verses 25 to 27, we see Paul speaking to King Agrippa. And I think these are very, very important words. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak the words of truth and reason. For the king, before whom I also speak freely, knows these things. For I am convinced that none of these things escapes his attention, since this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. Jesus did not die in a corner. Jesus died publicly. And our witness is on public display, whether you are a dairy farmer, a seminarian, or an accountant. Because Jesus is the light of the world, and he has saved us, we also are called to be the light of the world. When Jesus rose on Easter morning, the sun never went down. You have seen these things. You know these things are true. And so you are a public witness to the name of Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would apply Luke 24 to our lives. We pray that you would help us to go out and live for you. We pray that 
in any career we have, that you would change our lives so much that people would see that Jesus really does forgive sins. And we pray that you would help us to be a light to the nations, both in our words and our deeds, that our language would reflect our faith, that our actions would also reflect our faith. And we pray that you would help us to live for you. Help us to know you and the power of your resurrection. And help us to declare the whole counsel of God, the entire scriptures, to the world that is around us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our song of response is, uh, we'll stand for the song of response, which will be Psalter Hymnal number 400.